Good evening, everyone, and um, thank you for coming. Welcome to the first uh, scrutiny panel for the community, the organization and community scrutiny panel. It's actually a new one, um, and this is the first meeting of the municipal year. So I just want to welcome members and officers. We've got Azuka, Head of Legal, uh, Damon, uh, Director of Finance, Stephanie Mills, Head of HR, and Councillor Denise Harland, who is the Cabinet Member for Finance, Resources, and Social Value. Um, uh, just going to, we're going, just going to go straight into the uh, meeting for tonight. So item number one, apologies for absence. Um, so you've got none by receiver, an apology from Councillor Jo Vanderbroek. She had um, emailed me to let me know she would not be here um, this evening. I've not had any others. Uh, item number two, urgent business. I'm not aware of any. Item number three, declaration of interest. Please note the declaration of interest in the pack. Um, are there any other declaration to be declared? Thank, thank you. And I'm really sorry I forgot to mention that this meeting is being recorded. Um, if any member wishes to speak, please um, unmute yourself, speak into the mic. Uh, so unmute yourself, speak into the mic, mic and um, go back on mute. Um, thank you. Sorry, next meeting I will make sure that it's mentioned at the beginning of the meeting. Item number four, cabinet members update. So we will be receiving a verbal update. Um, we've got handout that has been distributed to members. So I'm going to uh, hand over to Denise. Um, perhaps you can run through, I, don't, um, I haven't had time to read, but perhaps you can run through some of the successes and the challenges from prior year and your priorities for uh, this municipal year. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Chair, and good evening, everyone on the panel. Um, just very quickly, I think there was a slight confusion over whether you wanted a written report or a verbal update. And I think on the eve of publication, we were asked if we wanted to provide something in writing, but the notice was too short for us to be able to, to do that. So it was definitely a verbal update. Uh, and so by ease, you have a bit of a hybrid <laughs> because you've got a written report that you can ponder on later for next time we meet, as well as being able to pick the bones out of it this evening. So what I'll do, I won't read the entire thing, but what we've done here is to organise it in terms of our missions. And we know that you're particularly interested in mission 19 and 20, and so we've put those at the front of the report for ease and for focus. So in terms of our council working in the most efficient and effective ways, Legal services are, of course, enablers right across the council and contribute to achieving all 20 missions in our Greenwich. And our priority this year is to provide detailed information to each directorate over trends in 24-25, which will help to generate innovative, collaborative ideas for efficiency and working more effectively with the resources that we have. Um, the annual legal survey provides feedback as to its performance. And this year's survey, whilst not yet complete, in previous years have shown a satisfaction level of 90% or more. And our priority will be to address any areas where, is this, where there is any dissatisfaction with directorates. Legal services always look to make the best use of technology, to streamline and to improve efficiency. And examples over the last two years would be implementing a new case management system, which is cloud-based, 
and introducing virtual signing and sealing, which has saved a huge amount of officer time in terms of efficiency. Um, legal service has an emerging local workforce strategy. Our priority this financial year is to finalise the outcomes of the localised strategy with an aim of reducing the spend on agency staffing and outsourcing where possible and attracting talent into the organisation. We have a, a diverse workforce in legal services and an active EDI champion. Engagement in staff networks is always encouraged and we're proud to offer apprenticeships, secondments, honorariums and other development opportunities. Over a third of permanent staff have had a development opportunity in the last two years and we've successfully converted four locums into permanent contracts. Do you want me to stop there and take any questions, Chair, or carry on? If you could go on a bit, because we haven't had time to read, so sure. um, just carry sure. on a bit, please. So in terms of HR professional services, and in terms, again, of a Mission 20, um, a great place to work with a diverse workforce who have the right skills, who are motivated and empowered to deliver, the Council's updated workforce strategy continues to be a priority, and the critical focus of the strategy is to look at workforce need in the context of a range of challenges affecting the Council over the next four years, with a heavy focus on diversity and inclusion, well-being and equality, and recruitment and retention. Apprenticeships remain a priority for the Council, and we're keen to continue to focus on improvements in apprenticeship levels aligned with the ambitions of the draft workforce strategy. The delivery of the workforce strategy, which is anticipated in early autumn, with further support, the development and delivery of plans for clear career pathway development is aligned with the Council's existing and future workforce and needs to enhance opportunities for gainful employment and career development for those undertaking apprenticeships. And this work will include renewed discussion around the use of traineeships and work experience as a means of strengthening ties with educational establishments, promoting the extensive range of career opportunities within the council to young people. And an example of that might be, for example, the T-levels uh, students in both IT and in finance, say, for example, at Lee Academy Crown Woods, but it could be any of our schools across the borough. The Council has commissioned its HR service a holistic review of policies and procedures as these better support effective people management and decision making, driving efficiencies in our processes and addressing systematic bar systemic barriers. The programme of work is well underway with plans to better align corporate strategic work, including the workforce strategy, with our process frameworks to ensure that these support the Council to work in the most efficient way possible. Thank you, uh, Councillor Highland. We're going to pause there and I'm sure. um, going to open up to members for questions around um, uh, HR and legal. We've got um, Azuka here that will support, um, and Stephanie, um, who will both support in any technical areas, uh, should there be any questions um, of such. So I see uh, Councillor Pat Greenwell and Councillor Lakshin. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I just ask you, going back um, Councillor Highland to the, the um, 
I'm always concerned about the amount of spending on agencies. Um, you know, even when I go back to years and years and years ago, me as I used to be a supply teacher, and even in that particular area, I was all right. <laughs> I, I know and what, how much you have to pay out to these agencies, but yes, I was a good supply teacher. Um, but I know that this is a very, very difficult area. Have we got any figures or anything how much we actually, on an average year, spend on agency staff at all? Yes, Have yes, we, we do. And I'll pass to Steph, if I may, or is it Damon? But whilst we get that for you, were you ever offered a permanent job when you were a supply teacher? Were you offered a permanent job? At that the same school? Yes. Yeah. Because we found it's quite a good recruitment tool, actually. People come into the council agency and then they're persuaded. They like working here. They've tried it out. They like the area. They like the people. They like the work. And then they take a permanent job here. So, you know, recruitment and retention is always difficult, particularly when you're looking for skills that are in short supply. Um, but it can also be a good sort of recruiting sergeant. Who's going to take that one about the cost? Because I know it's come down, hasn't it? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Thank you, Denise. And thank you, Councillor Greenwell, for your question. Um, I mean, the short answer is, is that it is still too high. So the figures have started to come down. I don't have the specific number in front of me, but I'm very happy to take that away as an action and present that back. But we are in the sort of circa 20 millions, around 25 million, I think, is, is probably where we are in terms of spend. Um, I've got Damon to my right, so if we are able to clarify that in room, we certainly will, but otherwise, as I say, take that away as an action. Um, I think it's important to say that, I mean, Councillor Highland has given an overview of the work that's happening really comp comprehensively around recruitment and retention generally attached to the workforce strategy. We have about 13% of our workforce is a contingent. Um, in the majority of those areas, it's predominantly where we see largely skills shortage occupation roles. So where we know that the labour market is particularly difficult and where we have significant gaps in terms of being able to recruit permanent workforce to some of those hard to recruit areas. So one of the strands of the workforce strategy is to look in the short, medium and long term at where those workforce needs are so that we can start to identify plans for how we fill some of those gaps. So in some of the, the update that's been provided by Councillor Highland so far, we've talked about the strategy for legal services, for example. A typical example I think we'd probably all recognise of an area that is very, very high demand, very scarce in terms of its supply for technical skill and experience. The HR service have worked in partnership with the senior management team in legal services to look at a strategy specifically around how do we start to drive down things like use of external resource and very expensive locums so that we're, we're able to bring that workforce in in a more robust way. Um, we have had some successes in that area with some of that, that work that's happening, but I think it's just to give you a sense of the type of work that's happening across the organisation. So there is a very specific focus on hard to recruit areas which will support us to bring down agency spend longer term. It's not going to be a short term programme of work. It's very, very challenging and we've got plans to look at how we do that across all of the organisation more generally. Um, Damon? Yeah, I think as I said, as, sorry, as uh, Steph said earlier, we can come back with an exact number, but just to give you, put it into some sort of context, if we think about what this is as a percentage of the whole workforce, so, um, and the pay across, you know, the whole of the workforce. So for Greenwich, this is in the region of about 13% of, of overall pay. So, and again, to give you some broader context, if we were to benchmark back against, say, Lewisham, Lewisham is 16%. 
I think, I, but I think some of the measures that Steph you know, sort of outlined in terms of you know, steps that are being taken um, are very important. Um, I know Azuka has actually probably got some case examples if you want to walk, work through. Yeah, it, it's just to add that uh, part of the strategy that um, Steph referred to, um, medium, short term, medium and long term, we're very much at the short term um, stage whilst we're working towards the medium and long term outcomes. And in terms of the short term, we've managed to convert um, four of our um, locums, so that's about a third of the total number of locums um, within legal services to fixed term um, contracts. So there's a significant um, saving um, already. And part of the ongoing strategy is, is looking at the other um, locum arrangements that we've got. But we can't get away from the fact that, you know, we have, it's a very, very challenging recruitment market, particularly um, in, in some specific areas around um, contract lawyers, um, some property and regeneration um, um, lawyers. They're very, very hard to, to come by. So part of the strategy is also looking not just at retention, uh, at recruitment, but at retention. You know, what, what do we need to do in order to retain um, those staff in-house? And also part of that is that whole um, grow, grow your own. Um, so some of the development opportunities that we've offered within legal services are with that very much um, in mind. There are a number of paralegals um, and apprentices. We have currently one apprentice, um, but there are paralegals that we're actively um, trying to develop into some of these um, hard to fill areas. Thank you. Um, is that okay? Before I bring uh, Councillor Saldin in, just on the workforce strategy, it does say that it's at the point of um, ready for consultation. So um, are you able to, I know that we've got an item coming later in the year, um, but are you able to give us uh, any indication of time scale and maybe those who we'll be consulting with and um, what the consultation will look like, please? Yep, absolutely. Um, we are still very much on track for what we hope will be the final agreed version to be delivered in the autumn. Um, so it's probably important to say that the document has been through a consultative cycle. So we are very confident that we have a robust draft ready to go through those final channels. Probably important to say that some of the barriers to having been able to deliver this sooner are clearly a lot of the MTFS challenges that have hit the organisation. Um, which had seen some of the work around this pause. We've also delivered a whole staff survey very recently with a robust draft action plan, which is out to consultation with the workforce over the summer period, which we are absolutely committed to ensuring aligns with the delivery action plan attached to the workforce strategy. The two are interdependent of each other, I think, in terms of what we are proposing to move forward as a, a sort of comprehensive workforce plan. Um, so that will go through its cycle with GMT. There will be, the, the, I mean, the general sort of route of consultation will then involve a lot of our internal stakeholder groups. So we are proposing to discuss this further with our trade union. We've had a lot of input so far from the EDI steering group and the staff networks. Um, and there will be a, a, a sort of a cursory sort of consultation with members as well to keep them sighted on what those plans and proposals look like. Um, so yes, we are very much expecting to see this through to its conclusion in autumn this year. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you, Denise, for that update and everyone for your contribution so far. Uh, one of the comments you mentioned was around satisfaction levels and performance measurement of the various departments. And you talked about a 90% uh, satisfaction level and you know what you were doing to work on the next 90%, next 10% that's remaining. Uh, who actually provides the uh, satisfaction feedback? Because, um, I mean, I've been a councillor for two years and I've never been asked in all my interactions with the various departments on technical levels where I've sought advice from legal, for instance, on a, a satisfaction level on that. Um, and I don't know whether members are actually consulted on our satisfaction levels from that. Uh, the second part of the question um, is around uh, key performance indicators. 
So I'm assuming that as part of your performance management system and your performance monitoring system, in order to get to these levels, each department will have uh, key performance indicators or something similar that they report on to the cabinet member on a frequent basis, maybe monthly or whatever, some sort of you know, rolling backlogs here or how we're trying to fill one of our recruitment things. Are those developed? And secondly, I think seeing as one of our key areas of focus with the chair's permission is looking at performance, uh, it would be helpful to perhaps have those KPIs shared with us from the relevant directorates that we'll be looking over, uh, essentially so we can kind of see things as well. Thank you, Chair. So those were my two questions. Thank uh, I've got another one after that, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Saldin. Um, just in terms of the satisfaction level, that's the survey that we, Legal Services does annually with each of the directorates. Um, so it, it goes to the chief officers and the assistant directors um, and, and they provide us fee feedback. The um, survey for this year is still in progress, so it, it, the responses are still coming in. So that 90% that is, is last year's figure. But in terms of the question about, n no, we don't um, seek satisfaction um, um, feedback from councillors. Um, it's just not something that we, we have, um, have done. Um, but obviously, you've raised it, so it's something that we'll perhaps take away and, th and think about how it could, um, how it could be meaningful. Um, then in terms of KPIs, that they're actually in development um, as part of our review of legal services um, SLA um, with, the with all the other directorates. Um, the SLA um, is nearing finalisation, so the new SLA, I, I'd estimate by September, will be in place together with the um, KPIs. And we generally report to scrutiny um, on those, probably on an, usually on an annual basis. Thank you, Zuka. Um, did you want um, to come back in? Just a PS, if I can uh, just add something to that, thanks. Um, what, what, when I work with Damon, for example, we have a dashboard which is the equivalent of KPIs. So it's like, you know, if, if we're paying our bills within 30 days, what the council, to let, council tax collection is and so on and so forth. Right. There's a similar sort of dashboard or KPI. So absolutely, I think you've, you've yeah, that was my question. Do you have a, a dashboard of KPIs for each of the directorates uh, that you're looking at? And it sounds like from legal, we've heard that that's in development. You've already got that from finance. Do we have something similar from HR as well? And at what point, I suppose, would we be able to see that? Because I presume you're getting that. I mean, your dashboard would be on a monthly basis. I would imagine you'd be looking at that. And similarly, you'd be looking to develop a dashboard for legal as well on a monthly basis? Yeah, um, I mean, I think very similar to legal services in terms of HR. So there is an overarching review of the HR service at the moment, which again looks at performance measures and KPIs. Um, we actually have commissioned a specific piece of work aligned with the review of the service, which looks at those things. But I think it is important to say that that doesn't mean that, that the service is devoid of measures in terms of performance. Um, so there are very stringent criteria that, it's, that sit around a lot of the service delivery work that happens some of that is governed within policy. Um, others are measures that have existed over time which need a refresh as we embark on the new piece of work and you know, essentially the priorities resetting that will need to happen as a result of that. So that is already looked at and monitored as part of casework development. So that's looked at internally. Um, but yes, we are looking at a more robust means of being able to report on measures in the plethora of work areas that sort of exist within the service at the moment and we expect to be able to report on back on that once that's developed in a similar way to legal services. Uh, do you have a timing on that? I mean legal of services have said they're expecting to see that in September so I'd imagine this panel would be able to see that as part of the workforce strategy thing perhaps one of the early drafts as well. Certainly I'd be happy to make that commitment yes. 
to autumn, sorry. Thank, thank you, Stephanie. And just to say, um, Councillor Saldin, that we have on the next um, agenda, HR updates and legal updates, and we'll make sure those um, our data are commissioned as part of that report. So I've just made a note to, when we get to that item, to just um, make sure that is part of the scope. Councillor uh, Greenwald. Thank you, Chair. Oh, sorry, I had a second oh, question. Go no, 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 you go ahead. That was part one and two of question okay. one. <laughs> uh, question two uh, is around the workforce strategy. And I think one of the words I heard from all three of you was around, you know, technical skills and expertise and the importance of this. And I do realise that across all three, and having previously served on the audit and risk management panel, I'm aware of the kind of specialised areas that the director of finance and the, that directorate has. So from that point of view, uh, in your workforce strategy, will you be identifying uh, essentially technical authorities for particular questions? So I'm aware sometimes when you go to a large department, uh, and I've found this within my industry, the question you get depends on the context of the person answering it, and that might not be the correct question. So, you know, would you have, say, someone an expert on uh, uh, disability and inclusion and equalities and someone on employment law? Would you have sort of specialist technical authorities within your team who are currently, uh, who are currently designated as such? And if you don't, could you consider designating individuals within that? And I think that would probably help with your uh, building an organisation for the future? So the short answer is, is that we don't have that technical expertise within the HR team, but certainly we have that specialist expertise across the council as a whole. So, so I guess in terms of framing the, the answer to that question, we are very much working in partnership with the technical experts in each of those areas, which will help us to shape um, the intervention development attached to some of the ambitions that we are working towards as part of the workforce strategy. So if I I'd just give an example of that. Um, so we, we talk a lot about EDI being the golden thread that runs through the workforce strategy development. We have worked a lot in partnership with the EDI steering group. There are very senior members of the HR team that work as part of that intervention group, which is very much about hearing the representative voice from our workforce around some of the challenges that will ultimately need to feed into the intervention development in a range of, of, of work activities. Um, recruitment and retention is obviously a significant area of that. And one of the things that we have heard is that there are, you know, whether perceived or factual, factual barriers to recruitment and career development in some areas, which you know, we're only going to be able to get under the skin of and tackle if we look at the systems and processes that support those things. So it's, it's a very kind of nuanced area. You know, I, I guess the, the sort of point in this is that we are engaging the experts to understand what those barriers are so that we can create intervention which supports us to remove those things. Um, so we are very much working proactively with specialist experts across the council in each of these areas. It's a very, very complex area of work, as I'm sure the, the, the panel absolutely appreciate and understand. Um, so it's important that we do that in order to get it right. Um, and we're not doing that in isolation in a corporate space either. That's very much working along with directorates because, of course, the other thing is, is that the challenges in each of their areas will be very, very unique to the overarching corporate picture. So the supplementary work that we expect to happen, and this... I think we've already discussed to a certain degree has started to happen in some of our directorates is that once the corporate action plan is delivered there will be a very robust intervention to work with each of our directorates to look at those nuanced areas um, and bring in the right technical experts to help them to overcome some of those challenges. Um, it's a very loaded response, so I absolutely appreciate that. So very happy to take any supplementary questions, or if I haven't quite answered your question, um, very happy to, to, to break it down further. If I could, yes. Yeah. So really my question was recognising that it's actually quite a multifaceted problem. You, you all three of you, see in your uh, various directorates. Uh, my question was, do you have a list of actually this is the go-to person within my team on this sort of thing. So I know, for instance, in finance, you have a go-to person for treasury stuff and a go-to person for accounting standards. And I suspect in legal, or at least I'd hope in legal, there is a go-to person for contracts and a go-to person for 
procurement, recognizing the, the subtle yet fundamental differences in that. And also, you know, the go-to expert on electoral law. Uh, and uh, hopefully we won't have another election for a while yet, but, you know, we've had three on the balance as this council. So, you know, do we have those kinds of go-to people that we can talk to? And, and are their names written down against their expertise? I think that's a very different question to the one I answered, isn't it? So apologies for that. The short answer is yes, we absolutely do. Um, so we have we have technical experts in each, each of those areas. I think it's very well publicised within the organisation. We also have a, an HR intranet site which sits on the council's main internet, which signposts very specifically to the technical experts in those areas. So breaking that down your recruitment experts, your casework experts, your workforce development experts, we have all of those and they're very clearly um, signposted on internal comms mechanisms. Are you happy with the response? So yes, there's a lead. Um, if not, then um, we can always ask for a bit more in-depth response when we commission the report. So I just wanna make sure you're happy before I move on. So I am with the response from HR. I just wondered if that was, a, I'm quite happy to say yes, it's exactly the same in the other three directorates. It is true of the other three directorates. And their names are written down against their specialities. So, because I always worry about, you know, in my business, what happens if, you know, someone leaves suddenly? We call that, you know, what happens if someone gets run over by a bus? But hopefully that never happens. But, you know, sometimes people leave and that leaves a hole in your organization and knowing how many levels and layers behind it and, and where you go to when that person isn't there is actually quite an important thing. So, and that's an important thing to have written down. It is, it is written down for legal services. It's quite clear who your contract lawyer is, who your senior property lawyer is. And in the event that somebody moves on, that information is updated. Um, if, if something happens in an emergency situation, then the, 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 it's established across the council that um, inquiries would be made at a senior level and that somebody would be identified in order to fill that gap very quickly. So just as an example, if, if somebody was off unexpectedly long-term sick, um, then an inquiry would have to go to the assistant head of legal services for that particular area who would then either deal with it or identify um, somebody else to deal with it. Um, so there is, there is a safety net and the, the information is out there. Thank you, Zuka. Thank you, Stephanie. I believe Councillor Greenell has a question. Just, it's, um, just two very... Uh, first of all, is it all OK if... You know, because we've just got this tonight, if we, come, if we have any other questions, can we come back to you as a panel? And the other one is, in the workforce strategy, yes, I see that apprenticeships remain a priority, and that's something I, I'm very keen about. And I just wonder, is, can that be brought back to another meeting, further meeting, to see what, how the apprenticeship programme is, is continuing? Is that okay? I think that's really important. So we do have a meeting on the 31st of October, that's a planned date, and it's to take a HR update. We will ask, if possible, I think the timing, listening to what you've said, September, October, so the timing might be right, and um, it will be up to members to, um, whether let me know today or after, um, some specifics you want to be included in this report, so at least the information can be uh, tailored to suit um, our request. So there is an opportunity for that. Uh, Chair, could I extend an invitation uh, to anyone on the panel who's interested to meet some of the apprentices, um, which I've always had the pleasure of doing down at the Professional Development Centre on Wickham Lane. Um, I'll ask Steph to make sure that that invitation comes to you as a panel because meeting the apprentices and having that conversation is so much better than hearing it from us. Thank you and we look forward to receiving that. Um, if there are no other questions on the legal and HR side, I'm going to pass it back to Councillor Highland to carry on with her presentation. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Chair. So basically, following Brexit, um, there have been two pieces of legislation with regard to procurement that are important. One is the Procurement Act 2023, and the other is the NHS Provider Selection Regime. Um, and that, obviously, has caused a lot of work for the procurement team, as you can imagine, who are actually understaffed compared to other boroughs. Um, contract standing orders have therefore been updated to reflect the changes in the legislation, and the opportunity has also been taken to include improvements in internal governance, empowering members with early engagement for key decisions relating to competitive procurement activity, and there have been briefings for members on procurement fairly recently, and there's more to come. I had an invitation only today. Luckily, they're only one hour at a time, <laughs> because they can be rather uh, complex. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. There'll be greater emphasis on seeking social value outcomes and ensuring, where possible, that we are encouraging small, medium, enterprises and micro-enterprises to seek contractual opportunities with the Council. Overview and scrutiny will also see an annual update on the contract management from each of the Chief Officers, including both service performance and the delivery of social value. Now, the new legislation puts additional burdens on the procurement team in terms of transparency requirements, with a large number of new notices requiring mandatory publication on the government's website, including contract management reporting, which has not previously been the case. Additional resources have been made available for the procurement team to increase their numbers during this transition period, and the team will be restructured into category management approach. Please don't ask me what that is. I have no idea. But we could find out tonight, couldn't we? Um, which will support greater financial efficiencies by uh, interdepartmental working and cross-departmental working. For example, the people category will have a team responsible for children's social care education, adult social care, public health, and these people elements like homelessness, domestic violence in housing. Um, any questions there, Chair? Uh, because I'll now be talking about anti-fraud. Thank you, Denise. Um, I, I would like to say one thing about fair tax, and Damon might want to comment. Um, sometimes we have members who want us to, to not engage with Amazon or not engage with Meta or whoever. But when we as a council are looking to buy the cloud to secure our own IT, there are only these big providers, as you know, available. So it's kind of Hobson's choice, really. But also, you could take a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, as they say. So the government have fallen short so far, the last government, of holding companies to account around fair tax. So we do what we can when we procure to make sure that they are a fair tax payer. But you could not you could not turn them down for a contract on, that, on those grounds. And, and that is misunderstood amongst some members of the council. So it's really important that this group really understands that. Um, I don't know if you wanted to make a further comment on that. 
I'll just pick up a couple of things, I think, on just on that procurement section. So the, the, the category management um, approach will help um, with effectively some of the siloed you know, arrangements. So having somebody who's responsible for children's services, somebody different responsible for adult social care services, at the end of the day, they're people-based services. So put, you know, looking at it through a completely different lens allows us to see whether we've got duplication and economies of scale, et cetera, et cetera. On the fair tax um, uh, comments, I think I'd probably just reinforce uh, what was said just now. I think, you know, if, if having more teeth, uh, I think, would be helpful here. Um, certainly, as, as was mentioned, that was not put into the recent legislation. Um, but just to give you an example, I mean, one uh, recent uh, sort of IT contract um, that we were we were looking to award, um, you know, uh, as has been mentioned, you, quite often with I, you know, IT sort of contracts, you have a limited number of providers out there. It was a really great example where we had an IT provider who we were looking to award the contract to actually had a tax declaration published on their website you know, announcing that they saw themselves as a responsible employer. Um, and actually, when you sort of look through, you know, sort of doing the background checks, as we do with, with these organisations, looking at the numbers and going, well, you know what, that does actually look like the right rate of tax that you're paying there. So we do have some good examples, you know, of um, our contractors who are really open and transparent. Some aren't but it is difficult for us to make significant headway, I think, as has been mentioned. Thank you. And I think it's always difficult when we don't have the bargaining power. Uh, so you mentioned one of the cloud-based services, and it's actually a difficult one. But I think as we have declared ourselves as a um, fair tax authority, as long as we're doing our best um, to ensure that uh, where possible, um, we can avoid um, transacting with um, those who fall into those categories and doing our um, due diligence. I think that's, um, that's all we can ask for. We can push a bit more, but when we don't have the, um, when we don't have the upper end, it's, it's really difficult. Um, I will pause there and open for questions. Um, but I just want to say that uh, procurement, the contract standing order and procurement will go to ONS at some point um, in the year. And we have the briefings which are coming up. So there might be limitation to what we can answer or what members, uh, sorry, the cabinet member and officers can answer. Um, I would like to, before I come to you, uh, Councillor Saldin, I'd like to ask about I think you mentioned um, restructure. Um, I don't know the stage we're at, but it'll be interesting to find out or to have a, an understanding of where the responsible people will be sitting. Will they be sitting in the service or will they be sitting in a central procurement um, structure? So the uh, the report has has been authorised. Um, it, it it passed passed through myself a couple of weeks ago. So that's um, that's definitely on its way through now. Um, and yes, it will be sitting as part of a centralised function. There is a central procurement function. Thank you. Welcome that news, Councillor Saldin. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it was just a comment essentially about the fair tax stuff so i recognize all the comments that have been made and i recognize the hobson's choice as you so colorfully put it councillor highland uh, i expected nothing less uh, so one of the things we did talk about on the when we were talking about the contract standing orders was that with the emphasis on social value you could actually treat fair tax as a social value externality so when you're scoring a contractor and I think Damon kind of made that point. You could take a look at contractors and all things being equal, you could actually say, well, actually, we consider this a social value issue. Therefore, you get a higher score within your, the social value you're providing by paying fair tax. Um, 
and you can actually adjust that through your scoring weightings and stay on the right side of the law. It's kind of nice to have the head of legal here, hopefully agreeing with me. Uh, certainly that's the approach the UK government has used. I'm not quite sure what the, if that's going to change at all. We will ask the officers. <laughs> The difficulty we have is that the Procurement Act doesn't make any provision for fair tax status being um, a criteria. So whilst you, it's arguable that it can come under the heading of social value, it's, it's a very, very grey area. Um, and the advice that's being given is that whilst we can encourage um, bidders in relation to their fair tax status, um, we, we, it's not lawful for it to be a, a, a criteria, um, and nor should we be attempting to, to, to shoehorn it into um, under the fair tax um, heading. Sorry, if Council I Council Sultan. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chair. If I could just come back on that. Um, as you said, it's arguable, and certainly from my point of view, recognising we are a fair tax council, and we do have a strong emphasis on social value, I would expect our legal department to take a view on that and actually enable that. So, I mean, I'm aware that, you know, you get the defensive type legal views where you say what you can't do to keep you out of trouble, and then you've got the more, shall we say, expeditionary legal services, which I'm more used to dealing with, which say, this is what we want to achieve, this is how we stay on the right side of the law whilst achieving these things that, you know, we are elected as a fair tax council, and that's our policy. So I'd, I'd actually like that to be put in. And I do believe uh, that there is scope within that not to actually disqualify people on the basis of the tax. That would fall foul of it. But actually to apply weightings to the contribution that they pay uh, and you know how responsible they are. Because we are actually talking about corporate social responsibility here. And I'd be genuinely surprised if under our we didn't consider any organisation's corporate social responsibility commitments as part of our selection criteria. I think I can only repeat that the, the council will have to tread carefully. And I, I understand what you've said about expeditionary advice. Um, the legal advice is protective advice, protective of the council's position and the council's reputation and protection against challenge. Um, of, of processes where the legislation doesn't enable it. Obviously, there's scope for interpretation, but we're, we're not in the business of stretching the interpretation to the extent where potentially we open ourselves up to, to challenge, which can be costly, both financially, reputationally, and, and financially. Before I bring uh, Councillor Saldin back in, um, as you know, um, uh, Azuka, social value is very subjective. I think the ask is very reasonable, um, maybe one that could be taken away. So on the definition of social value, I think that varies from organization to organization. Um, so maybe between yourselves and procurement, Steph, uh, the other Steph, um, we could look at um, how we score on social value. So I, I wouldn't want to shut it down. I would kindly ask if we could go away and look at that um, and then report back at a uh, later date or report to the overview and scrutiny panel in terms of how we are looking at measuring our social value. Um, Councillor Saldin, did you want to come back in or that's... Thank you, Chair. You summarised it perfectly. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, no, I appreciate that, Chair. Thank you. Uh, brilliant. Denise, I will let you crack on. I think there's a few more things to say. Did you want to just carry on to the end? Because I think the rest seem to yeah. be um, yeah. Damon's area. Happy to do area. so, Chair. Um, well, just really, you know we have a contract with Bromley uh, in terms of we do their, look after their anti-fraud. And we have a partnership with them that's been going on for many years and that's been renewed for another year uh, this year, and then we have to see what happens next year. Um, I did mean to ask you about that, Damon, as to whether we could do a deal with them that is longer 
a longer period of time, um, a bit like asking the government for a, a settlement that's longer than one year. Um, the risk register was updated last year, and a new register and uh, format software was introduced. And the register will be fully reviewed again by the Greenwich management team during quarter two of 24-25, and will subsequently be presented to audit and risk um, and cabinet and council. Business rates, work is underway to review all business rate accounts in receipt of small business rates relief to be sure eligibility and liability is correct and up to date and the exercise is scheduled to be completed in quarter two, quarter three. Council tax works underway to complete a proactive data match exercise that compares the electoral register information with council tax records to ensure that council tax accounts in receipt of a single person's discount of 25% remain eligible to be in receipt of that discount and the exercise is scheduled to be completed in quarter three. I think when you look at the statistics of this, it looks as if there's a higher number of people claiming the single person's discount than is likely to be, if you see what I mean. So that's why uh, it's been targeted to be looked at. I think the good news is, as you know, the finance department continue to collect council tax beyond the year end. And whilst we took out 6.8 million of risk reserves to help with the overspend in 23-24, um, Damon's team have collected 5 million to be able to put back into risk reserves, meaning that we've actually just then spent 1.8. Um, in terms of digital and customer services, um, you may have read in the press today that the leader of this council has been made elected as the, le as the executive member for communities at London councils, which is uh, a good piece of news for us. In March, we went live with a new community, Greenwich Community Directory, which makes it easier for people to find support in the local community. And we work with different residents groups, practitioners, and local voluntary organisations and statutory organisations to understand community need and to build a product that responded to our local communities. We've undertaken a website redesign project with a real focus on meeting a high standard of accessibility needs. Not only have a sample of our most complex user journey across things like adult social care, housing, housing registrations, been tested with residents to check the services are easy to use and understand online, but we have accessibility needs for example, people needing assistive tech or a screen reader, at the, and we've made that at the centre of what we do. Greenwich supports and anti-poverty strategy, learning from community partners has given us a closer look at what support is working best across the borough and what can best meet resident needs. And working in support of Digital Greenwich is a joint venture between RBG and ITS. We've approved 17 RBG sites to move new connections. Um, and RBG acts as like the anchor tenant to help this joint venture extend its services to other parts of the borough. And we're working closely with people like Metro Gavs 
to represent the voluntary and community sector and to help increase the visibility of their services to residents. Customer services levy the partnership with LiveWell Service, which provides the best outcome for clients via any method of contact, so we can refer customers where they need additional help that we can't provide, including support with energy costs or mental health issues. Now, just very quickly, Greenwich Supports does not come under my cabinet portfolio, comes under Jackie Smith's. Um, but on her behalf, uh, here's a bit of an update, really. Um, we're already collaborating with organisations across the borough on digital inclusion. And, of course, digital is my bag, as is customer services. It's like a free SIM card scheme, digital training, access to devices, lending of devices, training digital champions at Woolwich Common Community Centre at Clockhouse. Um, we've been invited to work with the NHS to dis establish a baseline for digital inclusion in South East London and explore how we can support staff and residents who are working on a borough-wide digital inclusion strategy. And we try to design our services around the needs of residents. So this summer, we're launching an online housing support finder to help residents with housing options to provide transparencies about households' likely waiting time for social housing. I think as councillors, you will have the same experience as me, that people have no idea where they are on the register. Often they have no idea they're banding, they've no idea how long they may wait, and they've no idea how to get a review of their case. Um, and so that is crucially important. And the Financial Management Board, of which I chair about five of them, uh, we do one for te temporary accommodation. And Kit Collingwood's team have developed a hotel optimization tool, which, putting it bluntly, finds the cheapest rooms for Premier Inn. Or is it Travel Lodge? Premier Inn, isn't it? Oh, it's Travel Lodge, right, Travel Lodge. Because at one time, for example, we were using the one in Lewisham by the DLR. And that's actually more expensive than others that are not right by a DLR. And if people don't need the DLR, well, there's no point in, in putting them there and paying higher rates. So we can now book more cost-effective rooms for residents. And in the seven months we've been using it, it's led to a 13.4% reduction in hotel net cost compared to the same period last year. And that equates to over £600,000 we've saved in those seven months. So you can just see how the rethinking of services can be really, really useful um, when you've got these super tech nerds in the department who know how to make this tech work for us. Uh, we are looking at housing repairs transformation. We've recently redesigned our damp mould and condensation service offer and are now in the process of implementing that triage service for people. Secondly, on housing repairs transformation, we know that communication gaps are the biggest driver of resident complaints in repairs. So we've launched a series of operational experiments to target it. For example, we've launched a follow-on phone trial service for plumbing and carpentry repairs to ensure that residents know when we'll be back to finish. I think there was a 
crazy sort of incentive that people would sign a job off, otherwise wouldn't get paid. And they signed it off when actually the plasterer needed to come in or the painter and decorator needed to come in. So that's been looked at. Housing repairs contact, a free phone number's been introduced. Uh, when people first contact us about initial repair, and we're reviewing the service so that customers don't have to ring a different number relating to repairs that have already been raised. There is a callback assist, uh, which is launching in August, so that people don't have to wait in the queue. We will ring them back. We've developed a WhatsApp in customer services that is a two-way channel for any residents requesting and there is a British Sign Language interpretation. It's a digital solution for those people who are deaf or hard of hearing, free of charge, as you would expect, on our website and in the Woolwich Centre to help people contact services when it's convenient for them. Uh, the Device Reclaim Project has seen about £250,000 in cost avoidance as we've worked across the council to centralise devices and tape back underutilised equipment and redeploying it as is needed. Um, we've launched a new intranet which gives staff that single place to understand the organisation. We've sped up the request to recruit process by introducing an easier to use form, removing the finance comments, and delegating approval from director to the AD. We've mobilized Sandy Hill Road and Greenwich Millennium Village, where we've designed and helped to embed and deliver an improved new built mobilization process, which allowed us to let 133 new homes across Sandy Hill and the peninsula, twice as quick as we would have been able to hitherto. Um, and that has prevented a £345,000 in avoidable rent loss, rent loss and temporary accommodation costs. And it's allowed 116 families and 17 single people to begin a better life in a home of their own. I'll try and speed up, Chair. Sorry. Um, you know that we've got an issue with the housing repairs team in terms of the cost, and we are in discussions with the trade unions to try and reorganise that service. And the service is prepared for emergency repairs in case of strike action. Having said that, we have very, very good industrial relations. And I'm hoping that unlike many other local authorities, we can avoid industrial action at all costs. Council tax online lets residents self-serve everyday tasks, such as moving home, um, setting up direct debits and so on. Cyber security continues and we continue to provide uh, in-house built services and to make sure these cloud platforms are secure and easier to maintain and to be highly resilient of cyber attacks. But as you know, nobody is uh, you know, resistant completely, as we have seen with the hospitals recently and, and phlebotomy services. Adult social care are able to make savings because of reablement operational trials, where they're working very hard with people coming out of hospital to make sure those people have got reablement 
activities so that they can live more independent lives, preventing them from having to go into residential care. And they get up to six weeks free service in our community. Um, in terms of our council being a great place to work with a diverse workforce, with the right skills, who are motivated and empowered to deliver. Our digital team leads on and supports change programs across all our major services. And as time goes by, we will see more and more money saved through, through the IT department and through rethinking services. But at first, you have to invest in order to save. Um, and it's a key contributor to the realisation of our medium-term financial strategy proposals. And we've recruited highly skilled digital staff since 2021, which has brought the council into the 21st century fairly quickly, actually. We've increased our in-house accessibility skills. And I have to say, uh, they're a really, really talented bunch. We've got two apprentices working in that technology team, one on the service desk and one in the mobile technology team. We've been able to provide work experience to young people in Greenwich, which I have to say, before I was a councillor, both my children got work experience through the council, and it did them really, really well. Like when my son came out of university, it was the height of the financial crash, and he couldn't get work as a, as a planning and property development and planner and surveyor, uh, and he thought back to his work experience that this council had given him, which was at Coca-Cola HQ in Hammersmith, doing public relations and marketing. And he looked for a graduate traineeship in that and got one, and has now absolutely moved on um, to being considered to be, well, in a very senior position in his company. You know, at the moment, he's second tier. And, and, and I have to say that that just two weeks of work experience had a really profound impact. And it saddens me that the last administration, through no fault of its own, through cuts, had to kiss goodbye to the work experience unit here in the council. And I would hope that, that when you know, we're back on our feet and we've dealt with all these awful cuts, that we can somehow reintroduce that back into the council because we are the poorer for not having that uh, service to schools, which they paid for, but they could never really cover their cost, which is why the council was subsidising it and why it had to, had to go. But we do offer cyber awareness training to all staff and members, although I have to say I'm a bit shy when I'm offered a cyber awareness course in case it's a scam that the IT department is setting me up to click on. Um, but I will check that one out. Customer services have added representatives from the recruitment team to our open days to meet and process members' documentation for them to start work. And this considerably speeds up recruitment from interview to start date. And we've also reps from GLAB, who, where there's a clear synergy, and who provide interview skills for delegates to give them the best chance of success. And I remember doing a, a day with Barclays Bank where they wanted to recruit people for South East London. And they managed to get GLAB to do all the screening so that the only people presented to Barclays were people, Bar Barclays Bank, I mean, were people who were kind of job ready, really. And they took on 200 that day. And, and, and they included, uh, they opened up the vacancies in central London and we held that at the O2, and it was absolutely marvellous. And if you ever want to see a really good 
uh, job skills market do go along to Charlton Athletic when Michelle Rankin puts on a, a GLAB job skills day because it, it's all about skills and all about employment and it's absolutely brilliant. You have hundreds of people go through and that's in an era of full employment, let alone when we've had periods in this country of mass unemployment. And lastly, Chair, pensions is undertaking numerous projects, including the government initiative for a global pension dashboard. You'd be pleased to know, Councillor Salden. And this includes having an integrated service provider with access to pensions data 24-7, 365 days a year. Purchasing and creditors, the plan is to develop full procure-to-pay process, otherwise known as P2P, allowing streamlined processes and quicker raising processing and the paying of orders and invoices, which is being facilitated by the digital team. The Advice and Benefits Assessment Service is another example where we're reviewing our ways to improve efficiency in modelling demand so that we are able to insource some work that had previously been undertaken by a third party provider, which provides resilience for the service in times of peak demand. And politically, members here have made a commitment to keep supporting people uh, with their council tax benefit and the grant support scheme. And this council is committed to help uh, eradicate poverty and to provide as much as we can for the poorest in our community. Uh, and we're committed to review our council tax support scheme to explore an income banded model so that we can continue to provide that support to residents effectively whilst also improving our ways of working and dealing with anti-fraud. Only this week, I did a press release of five people who were caught either with cancelled blue badges or stolen blue badges. Um, two outer borough and unfortunately two residents in borough um, and they've all been fined. It's a difficult thing to do because disability as we know is often not visible. So it's a difficult thing for our civil enforcement officers to challenge. And so we kind of tend to concentrate very much on those that are stolen or cancelled. Um, but you'll see that press release. I just cleared that yesterday. And with that, Chair, I'll shut up. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Highland. It's actually quite a lot. And I do hope members were skimming through the documents as you uh, went through. Um, so well done on the work to you uh, and the full team. I just wanted to pick up on, uh, I, know, I don't want to delve into, delve into the housing panels territory, but you mentioned the um, hotel optimization program. And if I'm correct, I do recall that we've recently had a decision where we have um, agreed to go directly to a particular hotel. And I just wanted to know if we have agreed that how can staff then take full um, opportunity of the um, optimization scheme? I just want to know how they will be able to navigate that um, service when we have signed up or we've agreed to use a specific provider. Well, whatever provider you, you use, each hotel has a different rate on a different date and depending on their location. And what the, what the hotel optimization tool does is it will say it's 148 and the Lewisham one and the Dartford one might be 119. Do you see? So they are able to look to see where there is value for money and where, where a family might be placed, but ensuring that they're not putting the family out too much. 
um, depending on where the children go to school, blah, blah, blah. But as we know, people are being sent further and further away from the postal code in which they live and where their children go to school. And that is a sadness that we all share. But how you get out of that, I don't know. Damon, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I was just going to say that, I mean, there's been a tremendous amount of hard work that's gone into, um, should we say, alleviating some of the financial pressures that have come with the temporary accommodation crisis. I don't think we can use any other word apart from crisis. Um, so as much as supply of homes has, um, you know, has, has, has really reduced over the last sort of year or so, the council has had to move into the territory of actually acquiring units, you know, literally acquiring brand new units. So mention was made of like Sandy Hill um, and, and other sites earlier. So that's helping. Um, but still we have way more people in, homele you know, in, in a homelessness situation than anybody, you know, would, would ra was rather the case. So even if you know, arrangements are made to bring new units in, to put um, maybe to have on-block arrangements, you know, uh, 50 at a time or something like that, it's still not enough. And it's still not gonna be enough tomorrow or the day after and the week after that. So our utilization of hotels is going to be carrying on, certainly in the short to medium term. So, Whatever the arrangements are and whoever we're working with, we need to make sure that we are you know, reducing the unit cost as much as possible of every one of those vehicles that we are using. We will use all the tools that we've got at our disposal to ensure that we keep that cost down as much as we physically can in the difficult circumstances that there are. Thank you, I think um, that's a fair read an acceptable answer. Um, and the reason I ask is to make sure, as you said, um, managing the cost and making sure that there's value for money. And I just wanted assurance that all this good work that the digital team, that they're doing, that it's not getting lost in other services, so they're making best use of, of what we have on offer. Um, so that's why I ask. Um, any questions? No questions from members? Yes. Councillor Mohamed. Thanks, um, Councillor Highland. Um, this has got nothing to do with what's been covered on here, but in terms of, because you, you touched on the blue badge, which is a, quite a big issue, really, but not just for our borough. It's not just unique to our borough. It's, uh, a lot of boroughs are facing um, misuse of blue badges. Um, but another one that also is an issue not only in this borough, but others. It's uh, uh, subletting. And I think subletting is an issue that needs to be addressed. And I don't think the council is, um, not just our council, I think it, it, it's a difficult area to, f to actually find the evidence, but it is there if it's digged hard. If it's digged deep, you'll find it. And I just don't feel that it's, um, I, I think we're losing a lot of revenue on that side of things and those homes should be given to people who need it. Thank you. I mean, the housing um, department have got an unauthorised occupation team. Um, I mean, I think we see it, don't we, as councillors when we go electioneering and you knock on the door and you think there's one single guy opens the door, there's no family in there, and yet on, the, on your electoral roll, you've got, you know, three people supposed to be living there, and all we can do is come back and report that. Um, and it, in a way, it relies on neighbours, doesn't it, to actually report. And it's complicated, because where people have bought their own council homes, and then they rent them out because they move on, it isn't simple, but that's the team, is the unauthorised occupation team. And we just need to... I mean, I'm assuming, uh, Damon, that your 
Brendan Costello's anti-fraud team work hand in hand with so, the unauthorised. Yeah, it's, it's the single, um, you know, single properties like so one bedroom flats. Yeah are the issue, not yeah. the family homes yeah. that are subletted. It's usually this one-bedroom flats, yeah. you know, that are normally subletted. And also, people don't understand, you know, they think, you know, their mum dies, leaves them a house, they move into it, and they say to their mate, I've got a council flat, if you pay a £1,000 a month to the council, you can have it. And they think they're doing their mate a favour, when actually, there's, a f there's people out there who've been on the housing list for a long time, years, queuing up, waiting for that property. And they don't see that as fraud, you know? They just think there's a favour they can do for a friend. And it's all those misconceptions, you know, and sorry to say this, Pat, but when we had Greenwich time, we were able to put stories up there. Um, and now, of course, you know, we can only put out info. Thank you very much. Um, Azuke wanted to come in. Um, j just to add, Chair, that obviously in legal services, we see the end of, you know, the, the, the fruit of the work of the um, unauthorised occupation team and the um, um, fraud team. But there is definitely a, a proactive element to the work that the teams do. Um, especially the unauthorised occupation team in terms of, you know, verification visits, um, verifying identity, etc. But it is a very difficult area. But there is a, a, a steadyish flow of cases coming through um, to, to legal services and, and, you know, our success rates in terms of gaining possession and getting those properties back um, is, is good so that they're then available to those who are actually eligible for those properties. Thank you. Uh, last round of questions, and then we will move to the next item. Councillor Greenwell. Uh, thank you, Chair. It just, um, Denise, you, you um, refer to, I'm going back to Digital Greenwich, and you say that more sites will migrate when the Altamaria comes online later in the year. Do we know when that will be? It's um, page 12, uh, number 16 working in support of Digital Greenwich, the joint venture between RBG and ITS. Yeah. I just um, wondered if... I think it's in the autumn. Autumn, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Highland. Thank, Thank you, you. Azuka. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Damon. And just to say to members that um, Council Harlan's presentation will be circulated should you lose your paper copy and want to digest it a bit more. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. You're very um, welcome, and thank you for being so kind. <laughs> it's the first meeting. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Have a good evening. Item, you're welcome. We'll move on to item number five, um, and that's the work program schedule. So the work program ha was approved at full council, and we're asked today to note um, the work program items and to agree the scope. Um, does mem members note um, the items? Noted. So we're on item number five the work program schedule. So that's a work program for the municipal year. We've got the dates set out, but um, these dates just wanna say they're subject to change, anything can happen. Um, the other thing I was gonna to put to members in terms of the uh, schedule of meetings, we are expecting, um, according to this schedule, to receive another cabinet update in January um, but I also note that um, the uh, community engagement framework will be agreed next week um, at Cabinet at full council. Um, and I do wonder if this doesn't come into Council Highlands portfolio, I do wonder if members are willing to invite um, the leader of the council, 
um, to come and maybe give us uh, an update on, on that area of the uh, work program because our panel covers mission 15, 16, 17, 19, and 20, and that's the organization, organization and communities, and some of this falls within uh, Councillor Koreke's um, brief. And secondly, would members want to do that at the meeting on, in January, uh, where it's just a quick update, um, or do members want to leave that for the meeting in March when we are expecting to uh, probably review the uh, implementation? January. So we'll keep the agenda, the items as they are, and we'll ask if um, maybe a note if Councillor uh, Anthony Okereke could come at the next meeting in January with Councillor Hi uh, Denise Highland to give us a cabinet update. Remember the apprenticeships that I mentioned, how they were going. Did you, we say that that could be brought to, another, to the next meeting? Uh, it falls into, um, it falls into Councillor Jackie Smith's portfolio, um, but we'll speak to um, Denise because I believe there'll be an extension of inviting us to um, the, is it presentation? Yeah. yeah, so that's a, she'll circulate an email, but just to remind you that it's not in our, her portfolio. Item number six. Um, this is the commission of the future reports um, 3.1 of the uh, pack 3.1 of the report lists, lists the two items that we are due to receive at the next meeting in October um, and just to based on the previous conversation um, in terms of requesting information we want to see at the meeting there were conversation around the agency spent um, so we'll ask for that to be included. Um, Councillor Saldin mentioned having dashboard and performance um, measures and KPI, so we'll ask for that to be included both in the legal and the HR uh, document. Is there anything else members would like to be included? Sorry, it's the nails. I know Denise um, said in her presentation about um, liaising with um, uh, six formers like Cranwood, you know, about students, T-level students to for the apprenticeships. Um, but there are, uh, you know, and she says she also said that they also liaise with other colleges around this borough. But we do have high number of students who go out of the borough who attends Lucian, who attends Bexaleaf. Um, so I don't want them to be disfranchised. Do you know what I mean? They need to they go wider than just Greenwich because our students attend other at the area. So those students then miss out on that opportunity to be um, you know, given that opportunity to take up these apprenticeships or wouldn't necessarily know where to go for the apprenticeship, so liaising with those um, colleges as, you know, in our neighbouring boroughs would be important, I think, because I know I work for Christ the King in, Lu in Lucian or Blackheath, and we've got a huge number of students from Greenwich that attends there. It's a Catholic six formers, but a number of them wants to go into work apprenticeship, but they don't necessarily know where to go. And, you know, it's just, I just feel that they're missing out. Thank you, and I just want to declare an interest. I am a trustee on Shooters Hill. I didn't know that uh, T-level would come up today, but you're completely right. Um, Shooters Hill also delivers uh, T-level, um, so that is something that we can ask her to extend it to uh, colleges outside of the borough. Whether that's possible, I do not know, so we'll just um, put that to her. Uh, Councillor Saldin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, one of the things that did come up with both the HR and legal services was they talked about their skills, and certainly something legal services mentioned was you know 
they've got certain gaps in their skills that they're looking to fill and also looking to develop people within their organizations. Could we request a skills and competency matrix or, or so you know what their aspiration is, where they feel the personnel within their organization are currently, and then what steps they're looking at to develop that to where they aspire to be? Uh, thank you. Yes, we can request that as part of the report. So doing like a skills shortage. I think they're doing the rethinking legal services, which I think is what Azuka said should be finished, or maybe that's not the same report, um, will be finished in September. So that will identify any gaps in our legal resources. So is that something we can request as part of the... Yeah. yeah. Did you want something a bit more specific? Yeah, but I think that would be helpful. But what I would also like to see is uh, the experience and qualification of people in key positions. So, you know, if we've got someone in contracts whose principal background is property law, uh, that, that might be something that flags to us. So I think for robust scrutiny, we need to see, you know, do we have the right people in the right places? So really, you know, if we could get the experience of people and their qualifications for the roles that they hold, that would be really helpful as well. Just as a sort of narrative or table, something like that. Okay, that is something I'm not sure about in terms of our remit as a scrutiny panel and how much we can delve into the, um, the element of experience. But what we could ask for, maybe a matrix in terms of um, those who are covering the roles what the you know the level of experience skills, um, but not too deep, not um, not so much a granular detail because we might be it might be outside our remit. No, chair, that sounds perfect. I mean, yeah, the level of experience at so whatever level they can provide it. So. To request the diversity data um, within HR, like, is it what what are the in terms of recruitment? Sorry. In terms of recruitment? Absolutely, because that's on their dashboard. So um, it's one of the, um, it was actually a standard part of the performance indicator report for HR anyway, and it's on their dashboard. Um, so I don't see why we can't um, ask for that. But it's can, is, would, that would that be include, would, would it include um, the managerial and senior officers, like a, you know, a breakdown of how many of those are, for example, from the Asian background? You know, it'd just be nice to know a breakdown um, of, you know, as, as part of the um, Equality Act. Absolutely, thank you. Yes, we'll do so. So we will, um, we will request this before when we scope, when we ask for, uh, when we commission the next report, we'll make sure that these requests are included before the report is even drafted. Because what I don't want is to have a standard draft report sent and then it doesn't cover these areas. So we'll get these through before. Um, any other final point? Thank you. Just want to say thank you to members. It's my first meeting I've chaired, um, so I'm a little bit rusty. Um, next time I'll try and be a little bit um, more organized and stick to time. Um, on that note, thank you very much and have a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you.